Hi there. Welcome to Ensuring Quality in Online Courses. Today um, we're going to primarily give you an overview of Quality Matters, what it is, how you implement it, and what it means here at NIU. But hopefully you'll pick up some tips for uh, improving or designing an online course as well. Today you have two of us to present. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. And I'm joined by my colleague Tracy Miller, who is the Online Teaching Coordinator. You'll hear from her a little bit later. Feel free to contact us now or in the future if you have any questions about online teaching, online course quality, or quality matters. So we want to start with a little bit of a discussion. When we talk about quality for an online course, who do you think quality matters to? I have some thoughts. But first, I want to hear from you. So if you would type your thoughts into the text chat, who do you think quality matters to? Or if you'd like to use your microphone, raise your hand, and I'll cede the floor so you can use your microphone. I see the text chat already rolling in. I hear from um, Bill says students, absolutely. Beth, students, administrators, and faculty, very clearly, I would say definitely. Mandy adds um, departments to that. Yes, yes, Ed, the learners. That's an interesting point. Um, we often talk about in higher education students in general, um, or students specifically, but really learners is much broader than that and might include learners who are not in a traditional course, um, even a traditional online course here at the university. Jennifer, students interested in getting their tuition worth? Absolutely. Cody, also students? Yes. Isabel, wow, lots of input here. Students, the university, parents, teachers, and not necessarily in that order? No, I don't think there's a particular order to these either. Um, Jason, alumni, yes. I'm an alumni of alumnus of NIU, and I'm definitely concerned about the reputation, the, the brand of the university and how it's perceived. Absolutely. Well, here are a few others. You've got most of these on the list. Students, faculty, administrators, the university at large, absolutely. Um, I would add, particularly because we're an institution of higher education, our accrediting agencies certainly are very interested in the quality of our online courses. It's part of our uh, review by the Higher Learning Commission every year, every review. We also, because we're a state institution, are also beholden quite closely to both legislators and taxpayers. And legislators in particular have been very interested in the quality of online education. Um, Institutions have sprung up that are not delivering a quality product, but using federal financial aid money. And so the federal government and the state government both have been uh, really doing due diligence on behalf of themselves, on taxpayers, and on students to make sure that these programs, these courses, really are of a, a high quality. So when you're delivering an online course, I doubt you think about all of these people when you're designing it or delivering it. Um, but they are all interested in <laughs> what you're doing and how we as an institution are making sure that our online courses are high quality. So why then do we want quality online courses? I think that's a little bit of an obvious question, but I thought it merited some discussion. And I would, again, welcome you to add to this list if you have additional thoughts. One is certainly to improve student learning outcomes. We're teaching because we want students to learn. And if they aren't, then it's really our responsibility to do more. And even if they are, it's our responsibility to make sure that they are learning and that we continue to support that. We certainly have had a, an, a growth in conversations around retention at the university, which I think is a fantastic trend. So looking at retention in online courses is also a good reason to look at quality. Um, there's a lot of conversations in the online classroom around cheating, particularly with online exams. Um, and a good quality, very well-designed online course can mitigate some of that. It also helps students be more engaged 
with the course and more interested, therefore, in the content and hopefully promote lifelong learning that would include, I would say, as Isabel says, the, the improvement of critical thinking skills. I think that's absolutely a critical reason for any quality course. Uh, and truthfully, if you think about this list, it isn't only a list of reasons why it's important to have quality online courses. This is really why all of our courses should be high quality. Oh, a bit of a conversion issue here, if that's okay. When it comes to online courses, how do we, some big questions here, how do we define quality? How do we know that our courses are, um, how do we know what our standard is? where we're trying to get to for quality online courses. How do we measure that once we know what we're trying to achieve? And how do we evaluate? How do we more than just measure? How do we make a decision on whether this course is high quality or not? So today, what we're going to present is uh, Quality Matters, which is one method of accomplishing these three. So quality matters. These are some of the official definitions from, from that organization. It is a faculty-centered peer review process. Uh, and I'm going to stop there to start with because there's a lot of really dense information packed in here. So calling it a faculty-centered process means that it is about you, about your courses, and really driven by, by peers. So it's not an outside entity that is imposing something upon you. Um, it's a set of guidelines that you and your peers can use to uh, review each other's courses and come to some understanding of what quality means and if you have a quality product. As I said, so I got to peer review process. The next part, it's designed to certify the quality of online courses and online components. So this gets back to that sense of not only defining quality, but measuring it and making an evaluative judgment as to whether or not the courses are quality. And we'll talk to, there are some, some different stages, some different levels of that quality you might be interested in. Quality Matters also provides a set of tools and the standards for measuring and defining quality. Um, here, I also want to point out these apply to, they're designed for online courses. They also apply to blended courses. The most recent version of the standards also applies to competency-based courses. So if you're branching off um, with competency-based teaching, then there are still, um, the rubric, the standards here still apply to you. And there has been a lot of success in applying these same design standards to face-to-face -face courses as well. To learn more about Quality Matters, um, I'll give you their website at the end of the, the slides, and you can do some of your research uh, as well as talk to Tracy and I and come to additional training to learn more about what it is. There, oh, Mandy, define competency-based teaching. Yes, absolutely. Um, competency-based is uh, a newer trend, I would say. It's a, a newer approach to teaching in which instead of um, the learning objectives become almost more critical and more elaborately defined. So instead of having general learning objectives that would guide the overall course, you actually identify specific granular competencies or skills that students need to have by the end of the course. And then throughout the course, there are measurements, assessments designed for each one of those competencies and students progress through them often at their own pace uh, and by the end of the course, instead of being a, an ABC grading scale, it's more of a pass-fail of did you meet all of the competencies that you needed for this course. Uh, in a broader perspective, it's often broken up even more granularly across the program where instead of taking specific courses, you take course 100, 101, 102, you would actually have a set of competencies defined for a degree and you would study and meet those competencies, perhaps with a traditional course, perhaps with self-study. That's a bit of a more alternative design that, uh, to my knowledge, we haven't adopted here at NIU, but other institutions are exploring that quite heavily. Does that help? Excellent. Thank you. 
Thank you for asking your questions. So Quality Matters has a whole philosophy around it, really, um, as Tracy can attest since we're going through some of that um, right now, learning more about the philosophy of Quality Matters. And they call this the four C's, the underlying principles that define Quality Matters. The first is that quality to them is not a review, it's not a certification, it's a continuous ongoing quality improvement process. That means that while a course might be certified as high quality, that doesn't mean that quality improvement, quality review is done. A formal review might be over, but we still have a responsibility as instructors to continue looking at our courses and continually revising and improving them. The focus here is also on the standards, not only as um, a tool for reviewing courses, but a tool for designing them as well. So that there's quality woven through the entire process from beginning to design and develop a course through um, after you've delivered it, reflecting back on the process as well. The QM process is centered on several things, primarily on research. So the standards, when uh, we, we share with you some of those uh, general standards are not opinion, they weren't something that someone at Quality Matters thought was a good idea. They're actually centered and grounded in research on student learning. So these standards come directly from research studies and findings on what it means to, what helps students be successful in an online course. Tracy adds original, uh, a good point that this was originally a grant to identify what those practices were. Uh, and has grown beyond that then. QM is also centered on student learning. So the focus is entirely on promoting student learning and supporting students as they go through an online course. The process is very collegial. Because it is faculty driven and peer review, uh, it's a supportive process in which you get feedback on your course and you continue to make improvements um, until you're at a point where it can be certified. So it's not about passing and failing. Passing and failing are actually very forbidden terms. They're banned from QM. Your course doesn't pass the certification. Uh, it's maybe just, it's either met expectations or it has not yet met the expectations and there are some revisions to do. But that collegial process is about supporting one another and identifying areas for improvement. And then as I've mentioned several times, because this is a, a process that's peer and faculty driven, the whole process is very collaborative. Where again, instead of getting a review from a faceless anonymous group and you're just told what to do, QM is nothing like that. It is a partnership between the, the course representative, whether that's a faculty member or um, a, an instructional designer, and the review team, so that there's continual collaboration and discussion about interpretations, about um, feedback from the review team, so that it's, again, not imposed, not a, fun, a final product, but an ongoing, continuous, collaborative, supportive process with the goal of supporting student learning. There are, according to the research that QM has done, uh, seven different factors that, Im eh, sorry, tongue got tied, that impact online course quality. Uh, everything from course design and delivery, the content in the course, the course management system, which is Blackboard for us at NIU, the infrastructure of the university, whether uh, faculty are ready or trained or prepared for online teaching, and whether students are ready and prepared to be an online learner. Quality Matters only reviews course design. So all of these other factors for a QM review are sort of assumed to be in place. Um, and the emphasis is on looking at how the course is physically designed to support online learning. That also means that the QM process and review is not focused on online teaching. It's focused on online course design. So this is a, a distinction between the design and the delivery. Uh, let me give you an example. 
course design for an online course might have, would, should have, a clear grading policy with descriptive criteria and expectations for all of the assessments in the course. That's design. Those, the assignment instructions, uh, perhaps a rubric or a description of how it's being graded, should be part of the design. However, once students have turned in work, the way that you actually grade those and provide feedback, that is all teaching. And that is outside of what QM reviews. So a great way to think about this is that Quality Matters would take a snapshot. The review would be of a snapshot of your course before students start working. Once students are in the course and learning, you're communicating with them and teaching, that is a, a faculty review process that is still the responsibility of your department, both to determine what is high quality and how to go about doing that. So if that hopefully is reassuring that this is really about the course design. This is your plan for how the course will be taught, but not the actual teaching or interactions with students. So a few more things that Quality Matters is not, <laughs> just to clarify how this works. So Quality Matters is not about individual instructors or faculty or instructional designers. It's not about judging your quality or your skill. It's about the course design. Um, and because it's a continual improvement process, it's about continuing to refine and revise the course design, not about your knowledge of online teaching or your ability, your skill in putting that together. It's also not about faculty evaluation. So while achieving a Quality Matter certification would certainly be an accomplishment to be proud of as part of a faculty evaluation, this again isn't about evaluating you, it's about evaluating the course and uh, ensuring that courses are high quality. It is definitely not a pass-fail test. While it may seem that way, and it's a, a fine distinction, I think, between thinking about a course meeting expectations or not yet meeting expectations, that does seem dichotomous, like a pass-fail. But because the focus is on improving the course, the whole Quality Matters process is more of a diagnostic, a way to measure quality and continue to uh, to offer feedback and identify areas that might need revision. And it's certainly not about creating a perfect course. Um, I believe that there is no perfect course. There's the best course for your students. There's the best course for you as a, a faculty member, what you're comfortable with teaching. Um, but there is no perfect course. Everyone interprets how to teach differently. And with Quality Matters, the goal is simply to create something that is better than average. So as you'll see when we talk about the process, their benchmark is 85%, um, which is a pretty good grade, about a B on our grading scale. So that means that it's a, again, better than average, but not, it doesn't have to be perfect. Because again, it's a continual improvement process. So there's always room for improvement and it does not have to be perfect. So the Quality Matters process can start from a variety of places, but the most common place to start is right here with a course. So you have a course, generally QM um, recommends working with a mature course, meaning one that you have taught uh, more than once. The first time you teach an online course is always a little experimental, I think. Um, I, you think that this will work. Hi there, sorry, I think I had a little bit of a connection issue. They're doing ongoing testing of the, um, the, the network here on campus. I should have started with that warning. So I'm back. <laughs> Hopefully we're, we're back on track now. So I was talking about the Quality Matters process and said normally that starts here with a mature course that you've taught more than once. Since the first time you teach an online course, it might be a little bit experimental. After that, then the, um, the course will go through some iterations of self-review based on the rubric, 
Um, and then a few other faculty reviewers here within the institution before it might go for an official course review. An official review uh, is a, a lengthy process. It can take up to 20 weeks, about five months, and is reviewed by a team of reviewers who are specifically trained on using and applying the rubric. That review team will provide feedback, uh, really lengthy, detailed feedback on each of the standards and whether or not the course needs revision in order to meet that. If the course does need revision, then it will go through a revision process and then back to the review team until the course meets the expectations. The goal of a Quality Matters review is for all courses to ultimately meet expectations. There's, there is no expectation that a course would come into the QM review process and leave without actually meeting expectations. This portion here from feedback through revisions and meets expectations is that continual uh, collaborative collegial process of continuing to revise the course until it does meet expectations. Here at NIU, this is brand new. Um, we've only been working with QM for a very short time now. So this is also somewhat evolving. But to give you a picture of how um, Quality Matters is being implemented at NIU, the first and the primary use for Quality Matters is as a, a guiding standard. So it's now our, our as faculty development, recommended uh, standard for course design. So when we meet with faculty, when we offer training on online course design, what we recommend will specifically be uh, matched to the Quality Matters rubric. So that when you're designing a course, you design it in that philosophy already so that you, you are meeting the expectations or close to meeting them from the start. The uh, team with eLearning Services is also adopting Quality Matters as their guiding standard. So if you work with uh, the Division of Outreach and eLearning Services in particular, any of their instructional designers will be implementing Quality Matters as part of course design as well. At NIU, one Im very important consideration is that QM is voluntary. Um, no one is going to require that all online courses go through QM. Um, it's going to be a minimum quality level, a subset of the standards, as a requirement in order to be promoted by the Division of Outreach Services. Essentially, for them to tell the world at large that this is a quality online course, um, QM and the subset of standards of QM is the baseline for them to be able to be confident that what they're going to publicize to the world at large really is a strong quality course. And then finally, what I'm very interested in is starting to build a growing community of faculty and instructors here at NIU who are committed to quality online courses, uh, whether that is because you can spread the word to others in your department, whether that is um, a couple of programs we're going to offer to actually network and meet with one another to discuss quality in online teaching and online courses. Uh, there will be a variety of ways into this community, but we hope to build a network and a, um, a sense at the university that quality for online courses is essential. The rubric now. We're going to, I'm going to start talking about the way that the rubric itself and the standards um, are actually set up. So the rubric, the Quality Matters rubric, has eight general standards that cover everything from the overall design of the course, the learning objectives, assessments, the instructional materials, the interaction and activity in the course, the technology in the course, and then student success, as well as accessibility and usability of the course. Tracy will talk about each of these in more detail. Um, but these are, are the eight general standards that the rubric covers, all elements of course design. 
one key component to the rubric is a, the concept of alignment. In high quality course design, in the best instructional design, there are clear connections between the course components, starting with the learning objectives. Learning objectives form the foundation of a course. And then everything else builds off of that. So the assessments, for example, measure the course objectives and only the course objectives. So the assessments don't, me don't measure something that isn't uh, essential to the course. And they clearly measure everything that is essential to the course, as stated in the learning objectives. And then the other course components, instructional materials, the course activities, and the technology tools used in the course are selected and identified so that they clearly support uh, those the student learning outcomes. So that you can see that the materials, the activities, and the tools really bridge between a statement of this is what students will learn in the learning objectives and the assessments for how you measure that students have learned them. Um, a good example of this would be your um, your activities. If one goal of one of your objectives is that um, students will design a comprehensive research plan, then your course activities should be sequenced so that you can see a clear progression from starting to read about research plans, maybe critiquing and reviewing some research plans, and writing and designing components of a research plan. Your assessment should be creating a research plan. There's a clear consistency and connection between each of those components. And it's not, this alignment is not a new concept to instructional design, but it may be new for um, faculty engaging in course design, where uh, a lot of that's done for you with a textbook. Uh, now, in an online course with Quality Matters, you'll be responsible for thinking about this a little bit more closely and not only um, finding those connections yourselves, but clearly communicating those connections to students so that they know how the pieces of the course work together. The rubric itself is um, quite elaborate uh, and very, very carefully and thoughtfully designed. Uh, the rubric workbook that um, is included in many of our training going forward is 40 pages long. It's a whole book, <laughs> really, that identifies um, each of the standards and how to apply them. So quickly, the rubric consists of the specific review standards that align to each of the general standards, the points that each one is worth, and I'll talk more about the points in a moment, and a lengthy descriptive annotation for what it might look like when you apply that standard in an online course. So the annotation explains the standard overall, as well as offers examples for what that might look like in a course. So the scores, the points. Uh, essentially, each of these is a, a yes or no decision as to whether the course meets the standards or does not meet the standards yet. And overall, there are 43 standards that align to the eight general standards. That's a lot. But they're very clear and very precise and uh, very, very targeted, so they only measure a specific thing, one, one part of an online course. Those standards are broken into three categories, essential, very important, and important. Excuse me, my voice is going. The essential standards are all worth three points. And there are 21 of those. The very important standards are worth two points, and the important ones are worth one. In a formal review, and that's really the only time that the points uh, come into play, is with a formal quality matters certification review, the 21 three-point standards are required. You must meet those expectations. And then, as I said, you have to achieve 85%, which is 84 points overall, in order to receive the certification for the course. And that can be any combination, then, of the remaining one and two point standards. 
uh, essentially, for your design purposes, the points are meaningless. And I, I would recommend ignoring them as much as possible for designing. Um, use the three-point standards to make sure that you can identify the essential standards, because those are the components of a course that have been shown to be the closest tied to online student success. So those are really the, the essential ones that you, you must include in your course for it to be high quality. And then the others, again, that's where there's some interpretation and some, some choice involved as to whether you would like to, uh, where you would like to focus on in your course design. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Tracy, and she will go through each of the standards in more detail to give you each of the eight general standards, I should say. We're not going through all 43. <laughs> that would take forever. Each of the eight general standards in more detail. Thank you, Stephanie. OK, so as she said, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about each of the general standards. And we're going to focus on those essential standards a little bit more. So you can almost imagine that you know, each of these bullet points um, kind of describe those essential standards in some way. So first of all, the most important start of a review is to make sure that the overall design is clear and that you're really thinking about the um, experience for the student um, overall and how the components fit together. So can you tell me any ideas on how you think you could um, get your students started in a really good way in an online course? You can um, raise your hand or you can put something in the chat field. What do you think would be some good ideas um, in an online course to help the students get started? A course overview. Excellent idea, Stephanie. A direction page that's available when they log in. That's good, right? It needs to be something that they see right away. Um, a clear home page. Excellent. Good suggestions. OK, and the other thing that standard one really talks about is that the students are introduced to the purpose and structure of the course but that they are also introduced to you and each other. Um, so how do you go about, or how could you imagine going about introducing uh, the students to the purpose or to each other in the course? I'm just going back a little bit to Jan's suggestion of a welcome email right before the course opens. That's an excellent idea. Um, wel welcoming the students in general just gives them a, a really good sense that they're on the right track. I see some folks putting stuff into the chat, so I'll just wait a second. A get to know about me. Um, answer three or four questions about themselves, sort of an introduction for each student, and, and probably the instructor or faculty member, too. Great idea. Discussion board where students can share information. Oh, these are all great ideas. Thank you for contributing. OK, so ne the next one we're going to talk about is the general standard number two. And this is really. Uh, a really important one. It's one of the standards that starts getting into that alignment that Stephanie talked about. And in this case, this general standard actually is made up of all essential standards. So you pretty much have to um, address all of these in some way for the standards. They're all considered um, very, very important, right? Because very important is uh, the next step down. Um, so what QM is talking about when they're talking about learning objectives is what the learners will be able to do upon completion of the course. So this is something that really needs to be um, clear and measurable to the students in an online course. And we're going to talk about um, measuring, measurable uh, um, in many different ways as we go over these alignment standards. 
But you know, sometimes it can be difficult because the learning course learning objectives might be something that is mandated by your program or your department. And so, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, making sure that um, you can somehow translate them into something that's measurable or maybe even um, convince your department um, and how they might be more measurable if, if you have some doubts about that. But the other thing they talk about is that there is a module learning objective. And when we talk about modules, what we're talking about is how we sort of um, chunk up the course into uh, different components, different segments. Sometimes we use the term um, weekly or units, and we're sort of breaking things down into um, smaller discrete pieces. And when we do that, we want to make sure that these module learning objectives, again, connect to that course learning objective um, and that it all sort of makes sense. Uh, as an example, what I would say is if you had a course objective that said that students will demonstrate uh, the rules of proper citation, that might be a course level objective where a module objective might say something like students will be able to write a two page paper using, um, you know, a recognized citation format and properly citing their work within. So you're just kind of breaking it down into a smaller, smaller piece here. And they also recommend in this general standard that these are written from the student's perspective. And I think sometimes um, that can be so important because we are sort of um, communicating things to them. So we want to kind of step aside um, from something maybe that we're very familiar with and think about how the students might be interpreting this. Okay, so moving on to the next piece of that alignment. So when we talk about learning objectives, then we're talking about how we want to measure these learning objectives, how we're going to assess, how we're going to know that um, the students are meeting these learning objectives. And so the beginning of this really just talks about how we're going to connect these, we're going to align these assessments in a real way to the learning objectives and um, being really intentional about how that, how they fit together with the students. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, just maybe even creating a table that's going to say, you know, here's the learning objective and here's the assessment and this is how they fit together. Um, one of the examples for that that I would say is, you know, if your learning objective is that the students need to be able to defend an argument and the assessment is a multiple choice quiz, then you're you may not be um, really assessing what you're trying to get out of the learning objective. And so when you kind of stop and think about it a little bit, you know, then you make these improvements and you make the, the assessments kind of match up with the learning objectives um, in a stronger way. Um, the other thing is we talk about um, that there's some sort of um, grading policy that's clearly stated. And online learning has a criticism of, you know, students can definitely feel isolated and sort of separated. And one of the things they're going to be really nervous about is, um, you know, what are your expectations? How am I going to be graded in this class? So that's why it's, it's really important to set these policies up front. And maybe it's something like, you know, how you're going to put together a point value or percentage um, as you grade things. Or what is your late submission policy in the course? You know, this can be things that are important in an online course and really in a face-to-face -face course too. I think it definitely benefits from some of these strategies. Um, and then if you have any ideas, we'd like to hear them, but what do you think would be a good way to provide students with a good way um, to to sort of explain to them how we're going to evaluate their work and how it's going to be tied to the grading policy.
What is something we use as a descriptive criteria? Can you tell we were waiting for that? Yes, of course. A rubric is going to be a very good way to um, come up with this descriptive criteria on how we're going to review the student's work. And of course, it's something that we're talking about this afternoon. Uh, Mandy likes to give a rubric for particular assignments along with an assignment description. Um, no, assignment description, you know, it, that's just getting back to being really clear. You know, and it's so important to um, be clear with your students in this sort of environment. General standard number four is talking about instructional materials. And it's all about how the materials contribute to the achievement of the stated course objectives. We're going to say this over and over again. Course objectives, how do they connect? You know, this material should make sense and it should be clear. So going back to what Mandy said about the activities description, you know, this is where, um, yes, the activity may be an assessment, but in this case, it, it's a part of your instructional materials. And you know, it just needs to be really clear. And it needs to point back to the purpose. So why are we having uh, this particular learning material? How is this connected? And uh, why is this relevant to the student? Uh, it's important to kind of outline that. So this general standard is looking for evidence that there is this connection between how this material connects to student achievement and what the particular purpose of this instructional material is for the student. And um, I, one of the things when I was kind of pulling this together that I thought about was, you know, in some cases what we do is we ask the students to go out and find their own resources. Uh, they're doing a lit review or, or they're just pulling together their own set of materials. And one of the things that we often ask them to do is to actually tell us why they think this particular resource is valuable to their research paper or, um, you know, any kind of critical thinking that they're doing. And so in this case, we're asking them to um, we're asking ourselves to provide that too. What is our purpose for this particular um, instructional material? Stephanie says um, she definitely agrees with clear instructions. Yes. I think we're all on board with that. OK. So the next general standard uh, has to do with learning activities. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on learner interaction and engagement. And when we talk about interaction and engagement, we usually talk about it in three ways, especially in online uh, teaching and learning. Um, learner to instructor, how they interact and engage with each other, learner to learner and then learner with content. And so in this case, we want to be really intentional that the activities are promoting not only achievement in the learning objectives, but they're promoting the sense of interaction and engagement. And you know, the next statement always comes down to, OK, interaction, engagement, what we're talking about here is active learning, that students are not just passively um, letting knowledge and content flow over them, that they're actively engaging in this. Um, so I'm interested if you can think of any ideas of how you promote active learning in an online course, or maybe even how you promote active learning in your face-to-face -face courses already. Knowledge checks, discussions, chats, absolutely. Beth, I see that you're still typing. And I would like to a little bit more detail about what you're thinking of group projects. Stephanie's had students reflect on what they learned um, and apply it to real situations. Excellent idea.
yes, discussion boards and uh, papers, excellent ideas, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'm looking at the time flying by, um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about this next one a little bit. Instructors plan for classroom response. And um, this is one that's in this general um, standard five. And I think it's important because this is allowing the students to know how you're going to respond back to them. And you need to be really specific about this. And, and let me tell you why. Um, it's for you and your students. Um, when you're in an online environment and you're asynchronous like this, um, students can get into this 24-7 habit. And that can mean that they they might be up at 2 o'clock in the morning and um, sending you a message or posting on a discussion forum or asking a question. And they just feel like you should be readily available. And so by giving them sort of your plan for feedback, um, it's going to save you some headaches too, I think. Um, so course technology, general standard number six. Um, it, so I know I've, I recognize a lot of these names we're seeing here this afternoon. You've been to our programs. We always talk in faculty development about how um, tools should really support the learning objectives. Uh, course technology and the tools that you use in an online course should never be used just because you think they're cool or trendy or something new. Um, and so this standard is really, again, connecting the technology to the learning objectives. And they should be used to um, support student engagement. Um, I would actually say that um, some of the different ways that course technology is used in an online environment fits into a few different categories, um, fosters interaction, collaboration, and communication with students while they're in this environment. Um, it also may allow students to have more choice or introduce content or activities, um, thinking about different modalities. And then finally, the tools could be used um, for your own efficiency or productivity. And the one that really jumps out to me for that is um, to simplify your, your grading uh, in, in some really meaningful ways. And um, students love getting feedback and seeing their grades too. So um, your course technology is important. But I think I have one caution. And uh, we want to make sure that the course technology that we do use, that students are able to access it and that uh, we want to make sure that it's safe for them to use and that it's even current for them to use. And this specific standard talks a lot about how um, you can actually accomplish this. So not only are we looking to review for it, but it's saying, wow, what a great idea. Um, let me put that into my course. Number seven is learner support. And so you know what? There's two different kind of learner support that are kind of these essential um, review standards in the QM rubric. And one has to do with uh, technical support and accessibility policies. And we're really lucky here that we have uh, the DOIT help desk to help students with their technology issues uh, for NIU supported technology and the Disability Resource Center um, to help us understand and our students to um, benefit from the accessibility policies. Um, so the other thing that I would like to mention and that is part of the standard is that if you use technology or supports that are outside of and I use sort of support system. Um, try to look for those supports, those 24-7 um, tech lines so that students can support that uh, and support themselves. If you don't find that, just keep it in mind that then you become the support for that. And so you want to be careful that um, you think about that a little bit. Um, because students are going to be asking you questions about it, and you want to be ready to sort of answer those questions for them. Um, 
you also want to, if you do come up with a technology um, that you're going to have to support them with, you can use um, short tutorials or kind of step-by-step -step directions um, so that helps the student um, not feel so stressed out if they are trying something new. All right, finally, the last general standard uh, has to do with accessibility and usability. And it talks about the course navigation facilitating ease of use. And one of the things I'd like us to think about a little bit, and if you can give me a check mark, how many of you have um, participated in an online course or an online something where um, you just can't seem to find something? Or maybe you have even inherited a course and um, you know you kind of pulled all the the content and the interaction over for somebody else's course and you still can't find anything. Uh, give me a check mark if you've experienced that. Okay, so quite a few of you have. So it's really interesting when you, you know, you know where everything is in your course, but you need to make sure that that navigation is really clear for your students um, so they don't get lost like that. But I think the real focus in standard eight is accessibility. And so, you know, you need to make sure that things are accessible for the most amount of students, and that's definitely um, different things that you can think about, and the standards are very explicit on how you can sort of um, find ways in order to be more accessible and universally designed for your students. Um, and we certainly can help you here at faculty development um, with some of that, um, such as um, granting extended time on tests for students that have that sort of accommodation. So we are here to help with that. OK, so we're down to the last four minutes. So um, I'm going to just kind of point out those eight general standards again. Um, and this will be, uh, this is being recorded. And you can definitely take a look at this session later and kind of mull over those a little bit more and definitely come to us if you have any questions. But if you are interested in learning more as things unfold this semester, I'd like to introduce our online course quality series of webinars this semester. Each of those webinars are going to break down those general standards into even more detail and go over um, some ways we think that you can incorporate these standards and these quality measures into your courses. Um, we're going to be offering um, further professional development in the form of a half day and full day um, experiences. And we're looking for more um, faculty and instructors to become part of our community that you'll be hearing more about this fall. Um, we have the website here if you're interested in looking into quality matters a little bit more in detail. And of course, we always like to kind of close things off with information on how you can contact us. Stephanie and I have sort of taken on the role of um, we're going to be the quality matter experts in faculty development. So we're really interested in, in hearing for everyone and um, being more involved with your maybe um, desire to improve your online courses and bring some more quality into your courses um, as they develop over time. I want to open it up to questions in the last couple minutes, or if Stephanie has anything to um, kind of wrap things up, feel free. I'll turn on the microphone, too, so we're prepared for questions. Um, but in general, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here and for being such active participants. Um, I'm also going to put the evaluation link into the text chat. And we'd appreciate those of you who are here live taking a few minutes to complete the evaluation, too. And definitely reiterate as well, my final thing, I guess. I want to reiterate Tracy's point. There are a variety of training opportunities coming. Um, including our, the online series she mentioned and a few other face-to-face -face opportunities. Keep your eye out for those.
Oh, if there are no questions, I'll go ahead and close the recording at least. If you do have questions, feel free to um, keep them coming in the text chat.